In this video, we're going to be taking a .NET 6 web API and then refactoring the program.cs so it follows best practices and it's scalable. Now, this video is going to be really useful for anyone who's created an app in .NET Core or .NET 5 and they want to upgrade it. But also, it'd be super useful for people just wanting to learn more about .NET and best practices. Now, one of the great things about .NET 6 is it's got a load of new features which allows us to do things in new ways. So we have things like minimal APIs, optional startup.cs, file scoped namespaces, global usings to name a few. And to upgrade a project is very easy. You just need to change some configuration in your CS pod file. However, this means that you might not be using the best practices. Now, if you even create a brand new .NET 6 application, the way that the program.cs file is structured isn't optimal. If you need to create something which is pretty large, your program.cs is going to get really chunky, going to be really hard to refactor and really hard to follow. So we're going to take that program.cs and then apply some design patterns to it so it's nice and simple and scalable. Aside from refactoring your program.cs, another thing I think you should refactor is your YouTube subscribers list. And you can do that by smashing on the subscribe button and helping me out with the YouTube algorithm by clicking on the like button. If you haven't come across my channel before, I do videos every Sunday on .NET, web development, basically stuff that will make you better at your job. So if that floats your boat, then subscribe now. Don't be a numpty. And as a thank you from me to you, I'm going to show you a picture of a jumbo jet. Ooh, yeah. Now, enough of this nonsense. Let's go on and look at some reef pantry. We are going to start our journey off looking at a program.cs and a startup.cs of a .NET 5 app. Now you might be wondering why are we looking at .NET 5 in a .NET 6 video? And the reason is because first you need to understand the purpose of each of these files and their contents. Because in .NET 6, what we can do is munge these two files together, which is going to cause us a little bit of a headache. So in order to refactor the file later on, so we can understand where we need to put the different parts, you need to understand this bit. Trust me, it will make sense, hopefully. Now, in any application, we basically need a starting point. And within .NET Core 6, 7, 5, take your pick. This is the program.cs file. Now in .NET 5 and below, in order to bootstrap or start the application, we had to implement this method called main. And this was the same in .NET Framework if you were building a Windows app. And as you can see, our main method is a public static void main string array args. And within this method, we have to write some code that's going to bootstrap the rest of our application. Now, I've got this create host builder. And within this method, you can typically add in loads of things around reading and environment variables, defining like logging providers, stuff like that. However, the mandatory thing that you had to do was define where the website's configuration files lived. And this is done on this bottom line, which we have this configure web host defaults. And we're using this startup and we're passing in this startup class. And it's in this startup class, we're going to give the framework all the instructions it needs to launch our application. Back to Solution Explorer, you can see that we have a file called startup.cs, and this used to be mandatory. And within startup.cs, we have three main things. So first, we've got a constructor, and we're being passed in a type of I configuration. My configuration is basically going to be all the contents of web.config or your app settings in the new world. So it's got everything there that we can configure our application with. Now, within this file, we have two methods that we have to implement. Now, the first one is called configure services. And when you think configure services, think dependency injection. Now, within .NET Core, .NET 5, we get a DI container out of the box. Now, if you're unsure about any of this stuff, I'm going to do a video in the future with me for now. So if you want to do either third party dependency related stuff, Microsoft dependency related stuff, or registering your own custom dependencies, you'll be writing it in this configure services. You'll get passed in this I service collection type. Now, this is an example of a CMS production ready startup to CS. So in here, you can see that I'm adding in the CMS related dependencies. I've got stuff for adding in the cause related dependencies. I've got stuff for adding in dependencies related to a not found handler. So anything dependency related kind of goes in this. 
we also have to implement a second method. And the second method is called configure. Now, where configure kind of differs is configure is based on a HTTP request basis. So what's going to happen when an HTTP request comes in? Like what are the frameworks or what's the middleware that you want to run on that request? In a configure method, you can see that we're passing the I application builder and an I web host environment. And in here, we're going to be registering loads of different middlewares. So as you can see here, we're registering a not found handler. We're registering some routing. We're registering our cause policy. We're registering some authentication and some authorization policies. And this is basically the structure of how things used to work. This is a very crude example. But within .NET 6, we don't need a startup.cs anymore. So it's mandatory. So in essence, we can copy all the code from startup.cs and we can just copy it into program.cs. Again, a crude example, we need to refactor this. But this is basically what a .NET 6 program.cs could look like. Now, if we scroll down to the bottom, you can see that this file has got really big now. So it's got about 200 lines. And this is one of the challenges that you're going to get with a new way of working is that you can have a startup.cs. It hasn't gone away, but it's optional. If you want to work in the new world, you're going to have to deal with a way of refactoring your program.cs so it's easy to read, easy to change, and it's not going to create you bugs. So let's have a look at that. On the screen right in front of us, you can see an example of program.cs in the new world. Now, in a previous video, I made a review about minimal APIs, and you can see that video linked to in the related tutorial below. I went through a complete example of how to create a minimal API, and the result was this Chuck Norris, wah, wah, Chuck Norris API. And let's go through how it's structured. Now, the program.cs is very different compared to how it was in that previous example. You can see here we don't have startup.cs anymore because everything's been munged together. Straight away, you can see there's a big difference. We don't have a namespace. We don't have our class defined. And we don't have that static main method. That's kind of all being replaced by this one single line where we have var builder equals web application dot create builder args. So that bootstraps everything. Remember, in our startup class, we had two main responsibility, dependency injection related stuff and middleware related stuff. And this is kind of what we've got at the top of the file. So underneath here, we've got our services. So this is basically our dependency injection related stuff. We've then got this builder equals build. And then this is kind of related to all the stuff we put in that configure method. And finally, at the bottom here, because we're using the minimal API structure, we also define our API endpoints in code in the same file. And this is all this stuff here. So we've got Chuck Norris API, tell me a joke, joke by category, give me something random about Chuck Norris. And then we finally launch everything off with app.run. As you can see, the structure of this is very different indeed. However, if we compare this to the previous example, we're basically doing three things now. Dependency injection related stuff, middleware related stuff, and mapping endpoint related stuff. So this should influence how we refactor this so it's scalable in the future. Taking that old program.cs, I've now refactored things so it's more lightweight and scalable. I'm going to go through exactly how to do that and why I chose some of these patterns. This is my new program.cs. As you can see at the top, we've got this crate builder. That's .NET Core. We need that thing. Next up, we've got an extension method, and the extension method is called register application services. And it does what it says on the tin. In this method, we're going to register all the services within the application, so the dependency injection stuff. Next, we've got our builder.build. That's an essential .NET Core, .NET 6 thing. Then we have two more extension methods, configure middleware, you can guess what that does, and register endpoints. Now, the nice thing about this refactoring is that even if we're in a really large application, it's very doubtful that this program.cs is going to get that much bigger. Yes, you might want some extension methods for things like logging or environment variables, that kind of stuff. However, it's very doubtful this program is ever going to get larger than maybe 20, 25 lines. Looking at the top, you can see that I've got this startup dot reference. So this is an indication that I've obviously got some custom code within a folder called startup. 
that's exactly what I've done. As you'll notice, because we don't have startup.cs, I've now basically created a folder called startup and I'm mirroring all the functionality that used to be in startup.cs into these new classes. Now, personally, because I have more control over how I structure things and how I name things, my application actually makes more sense when I start using program.cs without a startup.cs. However, I do need to put the effort in to refactor things. In here, you can see that I've got three classes. So I've got the service initializer, the middleware initializer, and the endpoint mapper. It took me a while to think about these names. I think the naming convention is really important, and hopefully you can get exactly what each class does. At the top, the first thing we do is register application services. And this is where we're going to do all that dependency injection stuff. And let's have a look at what that class looks like. So in order to create an extension method that works how you've seen it, we need to create a static partial class. And then within here, we're going to create a static method that returns an iService collection. We can call this register application service, or you could do register dependencies or configure dependency injection framework, something like that. I like register application services. Then we just need to do a this iService collection services. So this is kind of key. And then we just need to also return that services object. After you set this up, the number one reason why you're going to come into this class is probably to register some custom dependencies. But this is the reason why I've got a separate method, which is called register custom dependencies, because this is the thing I want people to be aware of when they first come in here. Underneath, I've created another static method. And in here, I'd add in all my custom dependencies. In this example, I'm using a custom dependency called iChuckNorris repository API. This lives in this services folder here. Nothing special about it. It's just, you know, search Chuck jokes, get a joke, that kind of stuff. Now, the one thing I'd say is I'm using an add transient. I'll cover dependency injection someplace else, but use add transient if you don't know what you're doing, because this is the recommended type to use. Now, I'm currently trying to build my application. And as you can see, when it loads, I'm getting this invalid operation. A suitable constructor for my Chuck Norris API cannot be found. Oh, nightmare. Now, the reason for this is due to ordering. Let's have a look at my API. So in my API, you can see that I've got a Chuck Norris API. And in here, it's relying on this IHTTP client factory. And as you might guess, this needs to be registered before any of the code within my Chuck Norris API will work. Now, if we look within my service initializer, ideally, I want to put my custom dependencies at the top. However, if they've got sub dependencies that rely on framework things, third party registrations, that kind of stuff, adding it at the top is going to cause you a problem. So in order to fix the issue that you saw above, what I would need to do is simply copy the HTTP client dependencies to the top. And in this instance, if I just change things in this order, rebuild it, my code should hopefully work. Crossing my fingers. My endpoint should now hopefully be hit. And as we can see, we can now access everything. Everything is a beautiful. The order that you put all your dependencies is super important. So don't forget to look rascal. Aside from registering your custom dependencies within that method, it will also be responsible for registering any services that any of your NuGet packages or any of your third party plugins rely on. You may also need to add in some additional Microsoft related services that some of the more advanced features in the framework require. Going back to our Chuck Norris API, let's see how this maps out. So obviously I've got my custom dependencies and service initializer. The next thing I want to do is register any services required by any third party plugins you get packages. And in this API, the only third party package I'm really using is Swagger. Now, if you haven't come across Swagger, check it out if you're creating APIs. It's amazing. It's going to document your APIs. It's going to make life much easier. I've created all the dependencies in its own method called register Swagger. And it's very obvious what this line does. I'm registering the endpoint API Explorer and Swagger Gen jobs are good. And I'd say from my experience, when you typically need to register services that a third party needs, you're typically going to have to write one or two lines. I'd also say that typically in a production app, 
you're only going to have to register maybe 15 or 20 different things. So I really like this pattern of for each different plugin or package that you need to install, abstract it into its own method. First, this is going to make it super simple when you need to refactor later because you can come here, read everything really easily, and then you're going to have everything which is grouped together in a single method it makes life a lot easier. That covers how to move any code related to registering dependencies into another file. Finally, let's look at configuring the middleware, which remember was the second method in startup.cs and also registering the endpoints, which is the minimal API thing. Now, the difference in these extension methods compared to this is the type that we need to extend on. Now, remember in the first example, we had to create an extension method that used the I service configuration. And then within this example, all we need to do is configure on the web application. We're returning a web application. We're using our this, that's key and we're passing in type web application. Doing this will allow us to configure the HTTP request middleware, whatever you want to call it. So remember, everything in here is what we're going to configure when an HTTP request comes in, and these are the things we're going to apply onto it. In Swagger's example, we need to make sure that the Swagger API and all the Swagger UI is enabled when an HTTP request is made. And again, do what makes you happy, but in this example, I've abstracted all my swagger related stuff into its own method, just like the previous example. Down the bottom, you can see that we've got use swagger and use swagger UI. Now, going back to our program.cs, the final thing to look at is register endpoints. And again, going back to our endpoint mapper, it's exactly the same. We've created an extension. We're using this and we're using the type of web application. From here, I'm splitting things up into different endpoints. In this example, you can see that I've got um, two endpoints which are joke related, and I've got an endpoint which is random related. So I've just split them up, but you get the gist. By applying these easy patterns, we've gone from that 150 line program CS file that was just gonna get bigger and more bloated with more code spell. Now we've created a very minimal program.cs. We've created some additional classes where we can extend things easily. And now we're not going to have the same amount of bother and heartache than we did before. If you want to experiment with anything you've seen in this video, you can with my working example. So to get access to it, head over to my GitHub, which is John D. Jones POC. While you're there, be a legend and follow me and click on repositories and then do a search for Chuck Norris Minimal API. Click on that, clone it, and you're going to get access to all the code that you've seen in this video. That concludes how I'm currently structuring my program.cs so it remains lightweight and scalable. Now, obviously, if you're trying to refactor your code and you're going from .NET 5 to .NET 6 and you want to get rid of your startup.cs, this pattern makes it dead simple because all you need to do is basically copy the code from your configure method, add it into the correct class within startup, do the same for your configure services, move that into correct class. And then just in terms of your API endpoints in minimal API, again, just move things out. So you can do this refactoring really quickly, low maintenance, low bother. Now, do you agree with me? Do you think this is a good pattern? And are you going to be using it yourself? Have you got a new way of doing things? Do you think there's a better way? Do you think I'm just simply a num nut? Please let me know in your comments below. The final thing to say is that if you have found some value from this video, please click on the like button. It really does help me with the YouTube algorithm and grow the channel. It takes me a lot of time to research, record, and create the related tutorial for each and every video. So showing me some love gives me warm feelings and stuff. Also, don't forget if you want to keep up with all the latest videos I do on .NET 6, you can also subscribe to my weekly Sunday session newsletter. Link is below. Aside from that, hope you're having a great day wherever you are in this beautiful world. Until next Sunday, happy coding.